If you were asked, what's the greatest chapter in the Bible, what would you say? While every word of scripture is God-breathed and important for us to read and understand, my guest today thinks there's one chapter in what he considers to be the greatest letter ever written that might lay claim to the title, Greatest Chapter in the Bible. In our interview today, I'm talking with Andy Nacelli. Andy serves as Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and New Testament at Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis, and as one of the pastors of Bethlehem Baptist Church. He's also the author of Romans, A Concise Guide to the Greatest Letter Ever Written from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Andy, thank you so much for joining me again on the Crossway Podcast. It's my pleasure, brother. All right, you call the book of Romans the greatest letter ever written. Why? Because it is. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Luther uh, and John Calvin and J.I. Packer, and they, they all say something similar. I think of it, I, I'm teaching more systematic theology courses now, and I see that mm. all roads in the Bible go through Romans when it comes to theology. Uh, it's just supremely important to understand how the whole Bible fits together. Uh, no other letter in the history of the world has received as much attention as this one has, and I think that's for a good reason. And it exults in the gospel like no other. Mm. It's just glorious. So, so you'd say the hype is well-deserved, the fact that so many of us have heard a preaching series through Romans and had a Bible study on Romans. There's a, there's a certain fittingness to that. I think it's underhyped. It's I think it's the single most important piece of literature in the history of the world. Mm. Mm. Wow. Uh, so I'm sure that most of our listeners uh, for the Crossway podcast would know that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote Romans. But I wonder if you could remind us of some of the historical context behind the book that is really important for us to keep in mind as we actually come to it and study it. Yeah, and you can see this when you read the letter towards the end. It's not really evident the first half of the book, or more than half of the book. It's so doctrinal. It's a big doctrinal treatise. But in the end, you get these hints of what's going on in chapters 14 and beginning of 15 about Jews and Gentiles disagreeing about this or that. Mm -hmm. And it comes even clearer towards the end in chapters uh, 15, where Paul says, basically, I'm, I'm planning to visit Rome on my way to Spain, and I'd like you to support me. So it's kind of yeah. like a, you know, support me missionary letter on his, near the end of his third missionary journey, probably, as he's writing this letter, and probably writing it from Corinth. Huh. So I wish we could talk about the whole letter, because it is this incredible letter. It's so packed full of um, just the riches of Christian theology. Uh, but we can't. We don't have enough time for that. That uh, John Piper famously spent how how many years preaching through the Book of Romans? I think it was eight. Eight years every every week, essentially. Almost not every week, but yeah. it's, it's pretty incredible. So we're going to focus in on one chapter, a chapter that John Piper himself is actually referred to as the greatest chapter in the Bible. Chapter great eight. Eight. The great eight. So do you resonate with that? Do you, do you would you say that yeah, chapter eight of Romans is sort of the core of the most important letter ever written? I'm hesitating because uh, I have a reputation for despising chapter numbers. Mm. Uh, so chapter numbers are not God breathed. They're not. They're superficial sometimes when the Bible and they 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 artificially break up what's supposed to be a literary unit. But in this case, chapter eight is a good standalone unit. Mm. I, I, you could argue it eight one to seventeen is a unit, and then one uh, eight one to seventeen is a unit, and then eight. 18 to the end, 18 to 39 is a unit. But they, yeah, they do stand together, and it's definitely glorious. I'm yeah. not sure I'd say it's the most glorious, but it's <laughs> it's glorious. Yeah, well, we're going to dive in a little right. bit more to, to this chapter. Um, before we go there, though, I wonder if you could help us understand Paul's argument in chapters 1 to 7. How, lay that foundation for then when we arrive in Romans chapter 8. Yeah, so basically the letter has three parts, an introduction, and a conclusion, or the, or the book ends, and the, the meat in the middle. And that part in the middle has several sections. And here's how I like to, to think of it. The, f the first section of that middle section, it's 118 to about 320, is just saying that there's a universal need for God's righteousness. And we all need God's saving righteousness because we're all unrighteous, and we thus deserve God's judging righteousness. We deserve his wrath. So Gentiles are unrighteous, Jews are unrighteous, everyone's unrighteous. That's, that's the argument there. And then Paul proceeds 
321 to 326, I think is the most important paragraph in the Bible. Mm. Um, but that this section, 321 to end of 4, is about how do you obtain God's righteousness? And it's faith alone in Jesus is how God will declare us righteous. So I, I summarize 321 to 26, that important paragraph, as the righteous God righteously righteous is the unrighteous. Mm, using righteous as, as a verb. Right That's there. right, justify. Justifies. Yeah. Mm. And then the means of that is for both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles is faith alone, and then Abraham illustrates that. So that's that's the next section. Then the next step is chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. They're a unit, and this section is a, the benefits of obtaining God's righteousness. I mean, five one. therefore, since we've been justified by faith, and then he goes on. So these are results, benefits that come from obtaining God's righteousness, gracious, glorious gifts. And you could enumerate them in, in a list of six. The first one is the first half of chapter five, that we have peace with God through Christ. So we, we hope, we confidently expect that Christ will save us from God's wrath. And the second is the second half of chapter five, that we're no longer in Adam, but in Christ. So Adam brought condemnation, Christ brought justification, and thus we receive the abundant grace and righteousness in Christ. And the third is chapter 6, we're free from sin's enslaving power. The fourth is chapter 7, we're free from the Mosaic Law's binding authority. And then the fifth and the sixth are the first half and the latter half of chapter 8, that we're free from condemnation because we're in Christ and have the Spirit. That's 8, 1 to 17. And then we confidently expect, we hope that God will glorify us and that nothing can successfully be against us. That's 818 to 39. Mm. So then before we jump into some of those, uh, some of those key uh, verses and passages in chapter 8, I wonder if you could also then speak a little bit to what then Paul does after chapter 8 in, verses, in chapters 9 to 16. Yep. Um, so if, if 5, 6, 7, 8 is about the benefits of obtaining God's righteousness, 9, 10, and 11 are vindicating God's righteousness. So, What do you the, mean by that? The, it's defending God. So the thesis is chapter 9, verse 6, first part of it. Uh, God's word has not failed because, and then here's how he unpacks that argument. God's word has not failed. Here's why. He has kept his word in the past. He is keeping his word in the present and he will keep his promises to ethnic Israelites in the future. So that this is one big vindication of God's mm. righteousness, and it ends with a f- this glorious doxology at the very end, uh, 11, 33 to 36. Then the next word is therefore, 12, 1, uh, and it's saying let's live in light of all these glorious truths, live in light of God's righteousness. The gospel transforms us. So respond to God's mercies by presenting yourself to God as a living sacrifice. And then there are all these exhortations in chapters 12 and 13 to love one another. And then in 14 and first half of 15, exhortations about quarreling over disputable matters. So welcome one another. Don't cause your brother or sister to stumble. Build up your brother or sister. Welcome one another to glorify God. And then the second half of 15 and, and then the rest of 16 is just a conclusion of, you know, here are my travel plans and my missionary situation. He greets fellow Christians in Rome, warns about false teachers, and greets his co-workers and ends with a, another glorious doxology. Mm, yeah. Thank you. So that's such a helpful summary of the book of Romans. Um, but let's jump in now uh, to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, and uh, as every good uh, Bible student will know, when you first come across a therefore in the text of Scripture, mm-hmm. you've got to ask what it's there for. Mm-hmm. So verse 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So to start us off, what is that therefore there for? I think that therefore signifies that there's that it's, there's an inference he's drawing, and it's at least of the previous sentence. That's 7, 24, 25, but I think it's more broadly chapters 5 and 6 and 7, and really especially the end of the, the, the latter half of chapter 5. So he's saying, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there's now no condemnation, meaning the condemnation is the opposite of justification. So those whom God has justified are in Christ Jesus, so they will not experience God's wrath. Oh, it's amazing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So throughout this chapter, we often see the flesh and the spirit contrasted Mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. It's this thing that keeps, Paul keeps coming back to those two terms, and he keeps contrasting them. Uh, What's he getting at with those two words? Because I think those are words that uh, 
in in the broad uh, scope of Christian theology can uh, there's a lot of confusion about what is meant by that when we see it in Scripture. So how would you help us understand that? Okay, I I actually did a study a while back on every time the Bible pairs together flesh and spirit language, and I noticed several several ways, different ways, overlapping ways that the the Bible writers contrast those. So not two. just Paul, you're looking at the whole Bible. Yeah. So sometimes it's a physical versus a spiritual aspect. Like like Paul says in Second Corinthians, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body. That's sarx. That's a word translated flesh sometimes, body and spirit. So there's physical, spiritual. Sometimes it's like a, a physical weakness versus a noble desire. So Jesus says the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. Sometimes it's a, a physical body versus a non physical person. So in, in, in Luke 24, Jesus says, see my hands and my feet, that it's I myself, touch me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, you see that I have. Um, sometimes it's a physical body versus the Holy Spirit, like in 1 Timothy 3.16, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Sometimes it's imperishable versus imperishable body, like in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where uh, it's talking about flesh and blood, not being able to inherit the kingdom of God, uh, mm-hmm. nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Uh, sometimes it's a physical union versus a spiritual union. So 1 Corinthians 6, don't you know that he who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it's written, the two will become one flesh, but he who's joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Hmm. Uh, sometimes it's spiritual death and spiritual life. So Jesus in John 3 says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, sometimes <laughs> there's this, this human inability versus the Holy Spirit's ability. Uh, so in Earlier in Romans, Paul says in chapter 2, that there's no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. Mm. So so how would you summarize then how Paul is, yeah. is using those terms in Romans? Well, it's not just one way in Romans, mm. but in, in Romans chapter 8 in particular, I think it's distinguishing the realm of the non-Christian versus the realm of the Christian. So only non-Christians live in the flesh in this sense, and only Christians live in the spirit. Hmm. So the, the and in chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, Paul speaks this way, and then it's all throughout chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 4 through 13, it occurs repeatedly. Christians in this passage characteristically are in the spirit. Non-Christians are in the flesh. That's the contrast. Mm. It, when he refers to in the spirit, then is that a reference to the Holy Spirit in this place? I think so, yeah. yeah. So I guess we should uh, perhaps feel uh, a little less bad if, if there are others like me who struggle at times to keep track of what exactly does this <laughs> term mean in this context versus another one? Because there is, uh, I hear you saying, there is some variety with how the biblical writers are using these terms. That's right, that's right. Mm. And just you got to look at the literary context to understand it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, verses 7 and 8 are, are two verses that stood out to me in Romans 8, and I, I wonder if you could read those two verses uh, and then explain what Paul's getting at here. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hmm. So that's a tough, tough couple of verses that I think probably fill many of us with a a bit of a sense of discomfort. And um, yeah, so what is Paul saying here? Well, to to start off, the first word of verse 7 is for. So he's giving a reason for something, and I think his, he's giving a reason for the previous sentence, which is to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So he's saying the reason uh, that that's the case is that the flesh's outlook opposes God. So it does not obey God, and more than that, it cannot obey God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's what theologians refer to as total or moral inability. So that's a result of total depravity or radical depravity. Because we are so radically depraved, we have an inability apart from the Spirit to please God. Mm. It seems like that's a, that's a doctrine that maybe isn't uh, well understood or taught 
today. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. So a lot of people hear the, so the tulip and yeah. the, the T is total depravity. And people just assume that total depravity means that everyone's as bad as they could be. That's not, that's not what the doctrine teaches. It just means that we are corrupt in every aspect of our being, in our mind, in our emotions, in our body, in our will. We are radically corrupt. Now, because of common grace, some are less corrupt than others, but everyone is still radically corrupt to the, to the totality of their being. Uh, and the result of that that's so significant here is that apart from God's Spirit, a person is unable, morally unable, to please God. Mm. So with that saying that, and that, that being what Paul's teaching here, is that equivalent to saying that uh, you would be saying you believe the Bible is teaching that an unbeliever cannot do anything good? No, no. Well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so there's none good but God, obviously. So, and, and, and whatever's not of faith is sin. So in that sense, yes. But because of common grace, non-Christians can do things that benefit other humans. Mm. They just, they're not righteous acts before the Lord. They're still filthy rags, but they can be common graces. So a non-Christian can invent some life-saving device or you know, whatever, yeah. and that, that's a good thing. Or they could even have an, an, an internal moral compass that would lead them to not lie and to... Correct be kind and generous towards others. Correct. So, so what, how would that, those kinds of behaviors fit into Paul's system here? Based on how he defines sin, and he does it later in the letter in chapter 14 in the 20s, I forget the verse number, but he says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Whatever is not of faith is sin. And by definition, a person who's not regenerate, not in the spirit, doesn't have uh, the spirit within him, mm. he's not doing anything of faith. Uh, so that, that sounds really harsh, mm. uh, but I think that's what Paul's arguing. He says that a person whose mind is set on the flesh, they're not in the spirit. They're actually hostile to God. They are unable to submit mm. to God's law. They cannot please God. And that seems inextricably tied to the, the argument Paul has been making in Romans about justification by faith that's alone. Right. That's right. Yeah. It also, the, that phrase in verse 8, they cannot please God. Well, in contrast, those who are in the Spirit can please God. Sometimes even uh, Christians today can get squeamish about that language mm. of us pleasing God. Yeah. But we we can please God by our obedience. That's all throughout Scripture. In the Piper Festschrift that Crossway published, there's an article by Wayne Grudem called Pleasing God by Our Obedience, I think is the title. Mm. It's very good. Which, yeah, I'm sure to, to many, that language... Uh, pleasing God by our obedience can, we have that, that fear of anti, uh, or of, uh, of uh, legalism. Earning God's favor. We're so, right. we're so concerned about. But if you understand the only way we can please God is through the Spirit's enabling, mm. it makes sense. Yeah. All right, moving ahead to verses 14 and 15, uh, we see Paul referencing our adoption as sons of God through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, John Murray, a famous theologian, uh, called the doctrine of adoption the apex of grace and privilege. Hmm. Uh, in your experience, do you think the doctrine of adoption is one that is emphasized as it should in no, the church? not at all. <laughs> it's, it's glorious, and I don't think we give, it, give this, this beautiful picture its due. Hmm. Why has the emphasis uh, been on, seems arguably justification has kind of been the primary focus of attention in Paul's theology, certainly, uh, yet it, it does seem like, as you read the book of Romans, the crescendo seems to peak in this doctrine of adoption through the Spirit. Uh, so what's, what's behind that? I don't know why it's given less attention. Uh, it might be that there have been just historically more debates about justification, uh, less of a controversial battlefield around adoption. Mm. Uh, that's my guess. Yeah, yeah. So, what would you? How would you summarize Paul's theology of adoption? What is he, what is he getting at with that metaphor? Yeah. Uh, to help us understand so salvation. So, verse fifteen says, "You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father." So that phrase, adoption as sons, that's referring to a Greco-Roman custom that guaranteed that an adopted son has all the rights and privileges as a natural born son. Mm. So it's saying that believers are already legally adopted and we're waiting 
for the culmination of that adoption when God will redeem our bodies. So this is one of those doctrines we refer to as already, not yet. We already experience it right now to some degree, but not yet to its final degree. Mm. And the reason I say the, the not yet is later in this passage, he qualifies adoption. Where is it? Verse 23 says, um, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, and the ESV punctuates us correctly, I think, comma, so what's coming is renaming. What is adoption as sons? Here, it's another way to re- refer to it, the redemption of our bodies. So there's a future adoption as sons that's equivalent to when God redeems our bodies, our glorification. Mm. So we're already adopted, and we will be adopted. There's an already not yet sense mm. here. Wow. I'm curious if how you would see this doctrine of adoption uh, relative to Christ's sonship. Um, I, I note how it's interesting to see how Paul, in this passage, uh, in the you know, middle of Romans 8, he talks about how we are, uh, in the, the verses following that, how we are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, mm-hmm. provided we suffer with him. Um, is there a sense in which... Uh, Paul views our adoption as sons of God as uh, as something paralleling or participating in Christ's sonship. I think so. There's there's a book by a man named David Garner, and the title is four words: "Sons in the Son." S O N. Mm. So we are sons in Christ. Sons in the Son. And I think that's a beautiful way to yeah. capture it. We, we want to avoid some kind of idea of, you know, divinization. Oh, yeah, we're not, yeah, we're yeah. not, we're not messing with the Trinity here. But there is a. It seems like Paul is connecting Christ's sonship and the privileges and rights that he has as son with our own sonship. Correct. And 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 as when we define glorification, we want to that God will share His glory with His people. We we want to qualify that by saying. He does that without blurring the distinction mm. between the Creator and His creatures, and the same with sonship. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's such a such an amazing thought uh, to consider. Um, so there are different views of what Paul means when he says that creation was subjected to futility and is groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Uh, a little bit later on in the chapter, what do you think he's getting at? So that's in verse twenty. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I think uh, here Paul is basically making the point that our present suffering and that there's, excuse me, he's making the basic point that there is, there is present suffering and future glory for non-human creation. And he's doing this to make the next point, that there's present suffering and future glory for God's children. So he's, he's comparing hmm. non-human creation with God's children. So he's arguing from one to the next. So here, in verse 20, when he says that the creation was subjected to futility, I think he's, he's talking about what happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and, and then God punished the man with pain in cultivating the ground by cursing the ground. So Adam sinfully ate forbidden fruits. The consequence is that now it's more difficult to grow food. Uh, God created earth originally as abundantly productive, but now he's cursed it. And the creation is subjected to futility because of mankind's sin. And that extends not just to the ground, but to fish and birds and land animals, and includes famine and sickness and disease and earthquakes and floods and fires and death. It's just all over. And God's going to reverse that when he glorifies his children. Mm. I've always been curious at the construction of uh, verse 20. So creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, uh, but because of him who subjected it, presumably God, mm-hmm. uh, in hope that the creation itself will be set free. So that that pairing of God, it seems like he's saying God subjected creation to futility in hope. It was sort of, there was like a, um, what's, he, what's he getting at there when he says in hope? So there's a way to use the word hope. Like my kids will say, I hope it snows on Christmas Day. We live in Minnesota, so that's a very likely possibility. <laughs> I hope it snows on Christmas Day. But it might not. It doesn't always snow on Christmas Day. 
that is not what Paul means when he uses this word. When he uses, you could just substitute the words confidently expect. Mm. That's the idea here. It, this is a this is a sure thing. So it's confidently expecting that the creation will be set free. That's going to happen. So perhaps one of the most well known but arguably misapplied verses in the whole book of Romans would have to be Romans eight twenty eight. Uh, I wonder if you could read that verse, maybe the surrounding verses there, and and highlight some of the ways that you think this verse is perhaps misunderstood. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. First thing is, when Paul says we know that for those who love God, <clears throat> some people think that this is qualifying, that this promise, this, this what Paul writes here, is not for all Christians, but for a subgroup. Mm. So some Christians love God and some don't. But for those who really do, this is what's true for them. All things work together for good. So they, they over-limit this verse. And that's not right, because the phrase, for those who are called according to his purpose, renames for those who love God. Mm. Those who love God equals those who are called according to his purpose. So it's the way believers, by definition, love God. Believers are called according to his purpose. So this is saying all things work together for good for believers, for those who love God. Mm. And you say, yes, what are ways people misuse or, or misunderstand this? Um, what comes to mind is some will think that it's kind of like this fate, like it just happens. Mm. Uh, but clearly what Paul's saying here is that God is the one who is sovereignly, purposefully ordaining and seeing to it that all things work together for good for his people. Mm. That's what's behind this. It's, it's not a blind fate. It's, it's not that it just happens to work out. So grammatically, it does say all things work together for good. Some, some ancient manuscripts actually say God works all things together for good. I don't think that's the best reading, but that is the idea. Mm. God is the one who works all things together for good. Yeah, he's the active right. uh, person in this. Right. Help us understand the word good. I think a lot of Christians could read this and say, mm -hmm. you know, um, my baby just died. Mm -hmm. uh, how, is, how does that fit into this promise that I have in Scripture? Well, there... Are, there are some people who would say that the good refers to health, wealth, happiness in that superficial sense. So that's a really prominent way of presenting what the Bible teaches in pockets all over the world. I think that's an evil teaching. That's not what this is referring to. So the all things has to include suffering, which is what Paul just talked about. In, mm. in verses 17 and 18 and 23, 24, 25. And he's, a, he's using all of that to accomplish his purpose for us in his grand plan for our good. And I think the definition of the good is in the next sentence. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and here it is, to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the good. God is conforming us to his son, and he's preserving us until he finally glorifies us. Mm. Yeah, speak about those, that next verse where we just see this, this chain of, uh, this incredible chain that Paul kind of lays out of one thing leading to the next thing, leading to the next thing. It includes some words in there that I think can sometimes be, um, they can almost distract us from the glory of what Paul's saying here, because sure. they can be controversial, they can be debated. Yeah. So walk us through what do you think he's saying at each step? Sure. I just remembered when I was uh, in college 20 years ago, my, I'm the second of seven children. My youngest brother got sick with cancer and then ended up dying. Mm. It was really sad. He, he was three when he got cancer, died when he was six. Oh. And I was meditating on this passage, and I wrote a hymn. And I, I don't have it in front of me, but I remember the opening line was, God works all things together for good. He has a sovereign will, for he called me effectually his purpose to fulfill. Hmm. I, this, is, this is not ethereal 
you know, just, you know, highfalutin theology that doesn't matter. Like, it really helped me process one of the most, it was at the time, the deepest pain I'd ever experienced. This is really practical theology. Mm. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and trace the, the logic here, but just know this is, this is comforting mm. truth for the most difficult times in your life. Well, and as you said, just a few verses earlier, Paul is talking about suffering right, right. in this present time. So he, he means it to serve that purpose. Yeah, so I think these are words of comfort. So, and, he, and he supports these comforting words with four proofs. And here they are. Number one, God predestined those whom he foreknew. Number two, God called those whom he predestined. Number three, God justified those whom he called. And number four, God glorified those whom he justified. That's his argument. Mm. So there are five terms there, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. And they're beautifully connected. There's a a golden chain here that's unbreakable, a five-link golden chain in which God's actions are unbreakable, foreknowing, predestining, calling, justifying, glorifying. Do you want me to just... Yeah, I I wonder if you could walk through those, because I think uh, some, I'm sure many have heard all those terms, but maybe the the overlapping meanings and significance of each could be a little bit hard to follow. So for foreknowledge, God foreknew us, it means not just that he knew ahead of time what we would do, it's the word's deeper than that. He he intimately knew or said his covenant love on certain individuals Mm. beforehand. So it's kind of got that personal yes, relational yes, feeling to it. Yes, God personally committed to individuals even before they existed. And some people think, well, the basis of that has to be that God just kind of looked ahead and he foresaw what saw our faith, perhaps. Yeah, saw what you would autonomously choose to do. No. He foreknew specific people. Look at the look at the words. Those whom he foreknew. It's not what he foreknew. He's mm. foreknowing people. He foreknew people. So foreknowledge is beautiful. Uh, he, he, he chose us before the foundation of the world. The second term is predestination. And so God sovereignly and unconditionally chose to save individuals as part of his preordained plan, and he's predetermining the destiny for some individuals to obtain an inheritance and adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. That's how Ephesians 1 puts it. Here in, in Romans eight twenty nine. the purpose of predestination is to conform us to the image of God's Son. And the purpose of that conforming us to the image of God's Son is so that the Son will be the firstborn. That means that, that Christ will be preeminent, the first and most honored among his, his resurrected children. Hmm. That's the purpose. But he won't be alone either. No, sons in the Son. Hmm. Yeah. And so we've got foreknowledge, predestination. The third term is calling. So there's... In the Bible, sometimes there's a general call where God calls all people in general, and then there's a special or specific or effectual call. That's this is the effectual one. This is and, and, and you would, and the the rationale for making that distinction is just you're you're just it's the same word perhaps, but you're looking at the context and Correct. saying sometimes it means this thing and other times it's more narrow. So an example would be the the saying in the Gospels: "Many are called, but few are chosen." Well, there's a distinction there. <laughs> uh, that's why one is general, one specific. This calling is specific, and it's true only of believers. And it's that God sovereignly, graciously summons and effectually persuades the elect to voluntarily believe the gospel. It's th- the best illustration is Lazarus. You know, Lazarus, come out, come forth. And it wasn't, you know, partly was Jesus pulling and the rest was, was Lazarus pushing. <laughs> mm. No, Lazarus was dead, and his part was God enabling him to come up, to, to resurrect. So this is, this calling... It, it's a guaranteed response that either constitutes or effects regeneration. And it, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a God-glorifying action that shows that salvation is of the Lord. God saves sinners. Calling. The fourth term is justification. And this is not that God makes us righteous. It's not about transformation. This is a judicial declaration. God judiciously, judicially, God judicially declares or regards believing sinners to be righteous. So when, when God righteouses the unrighteous, he's not unrighteous to do that. He's righteous because of the imputed righteousness of Christ based on Christ's obedience. So the opposite of justification is condemnation, and justification is not based on 
our works at all. Um, it's such a beautiful doctrine. God righteously righteous is the unrighteous. So we, our terms again, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and then the capstone is glorification. And that's God in the future when he, when he glorifies us. That means he will share his glory with us. So he'll transform our entire person, uh, our, our material and immaterial aspects, to perfectly conform to the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we, we just long for that. And there's one way of speaking to this. John Murray has a book called Salvation Accomplished and Applied. I like to, to, to take that and just tweak it and say salvation planned, accomplished, and applied. And that's what we have here. The, the, typically, theologians associate that with the Father, Son, and Spirit. Salvation planned with the Father, salvation accomplished with the Son, and salvation applied with the Spirit. But all three of them are involved in all three of them. They work together, never yeah. against each other. So God planned to save his people. That's, he foreknew us. He predestined us. God accomplished his plan through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and God applied his plan. He effectually called and justified us, and, and God's going to finish what he started when he glorifies us. Why is the word glorified in the past tense, at least in English? I think it's because this future glorification is so certain that he can speak of it in that way. But it's a little more complicated than that. So uh, in, in the Greek text, let me just pull it up here to make sure I'm speaking correctly. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's aorist. Let me just confirm that. Yes, it's an aorist tense. Now, the aorist tense form is just thinking of simple action, and in English, uh, a past tense form is, you know, def it, it, it's not a one-for-one, one, but mm. I think that translated as glorified captures what Paul's trying to say. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, Andy, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through uh, one of the greatest chapters in the greatest letter <laughs> ever written. Uh, we appreciate it. It's my pleasure. That was Andy Nacelli on Romans chapter 8. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, Romans, a concise guide to the greatest letter ever written. Pick up a print copy of the book for 30% off or get the ebook or audiobook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org slash plus. That's crossway.org slash plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you benefited from this episode and want to help us spread the word about the show, please consider leaving us a review. That really helps. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.